Hi there. I'm Paul Vixie. Thank you all for coming. I am not used to seeing so many of you at 10 a.m., but I guess it was the first day, so you haven't had any parties yet. Um, so, so this is about DNS problems and solutions, and before you ask, I will say it is not an exhaustive list of every DNS problem I have caused, nor every DNS solution I have offered nor of the list of problems created by the solutions I have offered. Um, so if you want to talk about why I used uh, IP fragmentation in RFC 2671, uh, the hallway is out there. and Don't, don't burn Q&A time on stuff like that. Um, good. So this is a subset of DNS problems and solutions which A, fits in a one hour slot and B, is kind of uh, selected for being of interest to this audience. And in general, I'm going to talk about what DNS is uh, to me, which might be a little different than what it is to the average user or sysadmin uh, or protocol engineer for that point, at that matter. Um, I'm going to talk about sort of how DNS has affected the world um, and what, uh, what the world is doing about it. And then I want to show you some cool shit. Right. Slide of my own. All right. Uh, Seth Breedbart gave an off the cuff answer to a great question. Uh, and his answer has been widely quoted. Somebody asked, but what is the internet? And he, uh, you know, because the dis point of discussion was we all have a lot of IP networks. They aren't all connected to the big internet. How do you differentiate? And he came up with the definition, which simply says that. Uh, the, big, the big one is the internet and everything else is just a little internet that's disconnected and it's a toy. Um, and what is most interesting about what he said is that the internet is all about packets, right? So we may use it for all kinds of commerce purposes or other communication purposes, but at its, uh, at its root it is a bunch of wires containing a bunch of information segments that are packets and these packets have addresses and the addresses are glued into autonomous systems and so forth. Um, so we overlay a lot of other things on top of this packet structure. Uh, for example, we have routers and switches and uh, as I mentioned, we have IP address blocks, we have autonomous system numbers. These are just overlays. There are ways that we glue certain collections of addresses together in a way that makes business sense or technical sense or phil philosophic sense to us. And to me, the most interesting overlay is not the web, which is overlaid on the internet, uh, but rather DNS. So if the internet were a territory, the DNS really would be its map. Um, unless you're using a lot of peer-to-peer -peer botnets or peer-to-peer -peer file system or file sharing systems, and I realize that's common in this room. Uh, pretty much whatever you do is a TCP session and that TCP session is going to begin with one or more DNS transactions. Uh, luckily these DNS transactions go pretty fast and they are cached and so you don't usually notice them. But if you're in the DNS industry you're used to dealing sort of with the fire hose end of that equation and uh, it can be an awful lot of traffic and it can cost an awful lot of electricity and, and person hours to make it all work. Um, but in any case, the uh, DNS is still there, even in mobile, right? A lot of people are not typing domain names when they want to go somewhere. They're, they're clicking on something or they're uh, picking up their phone and saying, okay, Google, you know, take me to a certain place. Uh, every place you might want to go that your mobile system is going to take you is actually the only way you can find it is through DNS. So you may not see the domain names but they are still present even in the uh, sort of newfangled Star Trek way that we're starting to use our, our uh, smartphones. And the great thing about that from the security perspective is that DNS has a rigorous internal structure. Um, you can lie endlessly about who you are and where you are when you are uh, posting a comment on somebody's blog, sending email, uh, whatever, you can steal credentials and so forth. Uh, but pretty much if you want to get work done uh, on the internet, you're going to have your services available somehow in DNS. 
um, and you can uh, you can bend those rules and you can hide you can do the best you can to hide but you cannot entirely hide and that's why I as a traditional DNS person uh, from the late 80s through now kind of uh, really trended towards security because it has such an obvious overlay if you want to know uh, where the bad people are and where their assets are and how they attacked you and where they were and so forth. Studying the DNS is the highest leverage way I know to find out that stuff. Um, right, sorry, I'm having trouble seeing my own slides. Um, so criminals have to use DNS just like we do. Um, they can buy cheap domain names, throw away domain names, um, and they can indeed use them for a short period of time and then throw them away, but wherever they hosted them, wherever they were, uh, wherever they still are, uh, has to be visible. Otherwise their criminal assets are not going to be reachable by their victims, which turns out to be necessary. And once you're reachable, once you have a specific location, then everything else that has a related location lo starts to look related to whatever you were doing. Um, and that has turned out to have huge value to those of us who uh, sort of spend our lives protecting things. Um, and you know, I'm quoting Francis Bacon here who said, nature to be commanded must be obeyed. That is true of DNS as well. Uh, you can hide your who is, either with who is privacy or just using uh, garbage addresses, uh, but you cannot hide your DNS services. Uh, you know, the, the answers you gave and the servers that gave those answers are a matter of, of more or less public record. So about that internal structure. Um, every domain name is in a zone. I promise this is the only slide in this presentation that will make your eyes glaze over. Uh, every DNS name is in a zone. Uh, so for example, com is a zone and vix.com, which is my vanity name, is uh, at the bottom of that zone but is also at the top of its own zone. In other words, that is a delegation point. That is a point where VeriSign, who runs .com, has been told through the registrar system, I guess by GoDaddy or whomever, that VIX.com is not part of VeriSign's namespace. There is a, uh, a, a, a delegation record set that says from VIX.com on down, that's Paul's server, that is not VeriSign's server, that's a zone cut. Um, every zone cut has some name servers. These name servers are designated by name. In other words, name servers themselves have fully qualified domain names identifying them. And every one of those name servers has one or more addresses. Some of them are v IPv4 A records, some are IPv6 quad A records. Uh, and again, these are the rules. Uh, this is as Frank Francis Bacon would say, nature. And if you want to command it for criminal enterprises, this is the part you have to obey. You're not gonna be able to do anything online for good or evil without doing, without following this. And uh, fun stuff happens after that. So in traditional DNS forensics, let's say you've been spammed or worse and you've got in your hand a domain name, um, you might want to know um, what does that domain name point at? Where was the server that sent it to me or where was the server that my, uh, my victim ended up clicking on something that looked like their bank but wasn't and so forth? You know, what's the answer? Uh, what you do, traditionally speaking, is ask the DNS question yourself that you think your victim might have asked. What is the A record or quad A record or MX record? You know, what is the, the record of a record set of a certain type that corresponds to the name that was used in the attack? Um, this has some, uh, some disadvantages. The first is it may already have been taken down by the time you're doing your analysis. Uh, the second is if it isn't down, then it's up and the bad guy who is presumably running the name server for that property will see your query and will know, will be able to trace at least uh, the, the edges, the outward edges of your investigation. When did it begin? What questions did you ask? Uh, and who are you? And uh, by the way, this tendency we all have to issue our DNS queries through the Tor system in order to avoid uh, you know, having it uh, be known that yes, we were an investigator, you know, either 
law enforcement or uh, private that was uh, looking this up because pretty much the criminals are not sending queries through Tor. So you might be able to stop them from knowing which law enforcement agency is looking them up. But the fact that the query came from a Tor exit gateway really tells the bad guys that, uh, that they're being chased. Um, right. So you can use who is, um, but that is crazy because any bad guy who doesn't want you to know his home address is going to use a stolen credit card and use the home address that corresponds to the owner of that, uh, that credit card. Or they'll just type ASDF into the who is fields and it'll take a couple of years for the ICANN wheels to grind that out. Or they can pay a little bit of extra and get um, who is privacy. Uh, and who is privacy is a whole other topic. but. Um, but the point is, who is is not going to help you very much. I realize there are companies in the business of selling bulk who is data and history, and I don't want to say that they are um, that they're lying about the utility of their services. I'm just saying that for my purposes, I have never depended on who is. I might look at it as a hint, but I will not. Uh, I, I won't count on it, and neither should you. Um, right. So the DNS has certain properties that have uh, had certain impacts. The world has reacted in certain ways. Let's talk about that. When atomic power was first announced to the universe, it was described as being too cheap to meter. The idea was that we were going to have electricity in every home in America um, that was so cheap there wouldn't even be a power meter. Nobody would worry about it. Obviously, this didn't happen, and a lot of other things about uh, atomic power turned out not to happen either. Um, like it's the distribution that costs the money, not the generation, so it's difficult to know what they thought they were saying. But this expression, too cheap to meter, uh, really is, uh, I think, a great way to describe the DNS industry today. Uh, you can now buy a domain name with a stolen credit card from a registrar in some flyover country in old Europe and it will be active for the entire world to be able to reach in less than three minutes. Um, I think that's an amazing set of technical obstacles that had to be overcome. I'm very impressed that we got it done, right? Any one person, any good sysadmin team even can do something like that. But to get the whole world to cooperate on something like that, that is, uh, that's a tough problem and it took about a decade. My challenge is to try to imagine a uh, good purpose for that capability. Why does your average person who is opening a flower shop down on Third Avenue need to be able to create their domain in less than three minutes? Um, why is a stolen credit card good enough collateral to be able to enable this global resource to exist? Uh, the level of fluidity that we have in the system really only has one purpose, and that is to annoy people, either with criminal purposes or non-criminal purposes. But we're talking about uh, a system, fundamentally, the DNS is fundamentally a system that has bilateral value. It is uh, something we all contribute to. We all sort of uh, drink the Kool-Aid. We speak the same protocol to the same set of root name servers. We subscribe more or less to the same namespace because we think that it's a public good. We think that our, the, the good that comes to us will outweigh whatever cost that comes from us in order to support that system. Uh, this is a unilateral purpose. This is somebody who wants a domain name so that they can spam you with it or so that they can f uh, issue a phishing attack or so that they can pollute a search engine or whatever. Um, so, you know, please jump out of your chair and rush to a microphone right now if you can think of a non-annoying uh, purpose for the fluidity that allows a domain name to be created at a cost that is too low to meter. Um, so Sturgeon's revelation was that 90% of pretty much any given thing is crap and that just goes to point to our pessimism. We, uh, we, look, we are top 10 percenters. We look at the top 10% and say that's barely acceptable and the rest of it is crap. And it doesn't matter what it was we were looking at, that's how we're going to feel about it. And that's, uh, that was 20th century thinking but it seems to be continuing now. Um, I can tell you that 90% is low when it comes to domain names. 
Um, we have a feed I'll describe at the end of this talk, a newly observed domain feed. And I now see pretty much the zeitgeist of the internet domain name system. I now know what it looks like, what the creation rate of new domains are, and uh, what they look like. And it is a lot higher than 90% crud. So, if you want to sort of back, put some back pressure, remember this is about DNS actions and reactions. If you want some back pressure against that too cheap to meter creation system so that the people who create most of this crud can't use it to annoy you, uh, then you have a whole bunch of work that you have to do. And this work has, this is a, a, a burden that's been shifted to us as recipients or as uh, you know, people who would rather that all of our communications be consensual and we're in kind of a low level cold war against people who think that, that non-consensual communication is better for them. Um, so because we can't prevent these names from being created, we end up having a whole bunch of cost burden shifted to us that has to do with dealing with them, coping strategies for dealing with all this crud. Um, and probably the most prevalent kind right now is takedown. Uh, and there are a lot of different kinds of takedown. I'm referring specifically to DNS takedown rather than uh, deep peering or uh, taking somebody's IP address space away or putting them in jail or any of the other takedown efforts that are also quite effective. Um, you can now buy takedown as a service. Um, you can either buy this from brand enforcement companies or you can just have somebody on call, some security company, and I'm not going to name any names, there are some good ones, but I would be afraid of leaving any out if I gave you an even partial list. Uh, but a lot of security companies now are in the business of taking phone calls from you as a brand owner and um, going after that domain name. They've got a lot of private relationships among the registrars and the registries of the world. They can get a trusted phone call in place in a few minutes that will probably cause a domain name that is infringing on one of your trademarks or uh, maybe it's being used in a phishing attack against you. They can probably get that wiped out in a few minutes. Uh, and that's incredibly impressive because I think by now we have all learned the lesson that doing a who is on it, finding out the domain contact and sending the mail saying please stop annoying me is probably not going to work. Um, so this is a great profit center in fact for some domain registries and registrars. Uh, in other words, they they've created some systems now, uh, almost like a RT ticketing system or you know, some sort of a similar automation that um, they will give you an account that allows you to uh, put your high value complaint in against a domain name which will cause it to be very uh, quickly reviewed and probably put into stasis, you know, put on hold in some way uh, while they complete their investigation and then they will just nuke it uh, if it turns out that it is what I said, crud. Um, and the reason that they are so happy to do this is because that means the criminals will come back and buy another one. So this is the, uh, the impact of being too cheap to meter is that you want your volume to go up. So takedown is a way to artificially spin your volume up. So it's, it's huge, it's wonderful. Um, but this turns, in my opinion, this turns the whole, whole thing into a game. It's uh, whack-a-mole as a service. And I really feel stupid when I'm participating in whack-a-mole at all, but, you know, let alone something that's institutionalized and sort of now built into the DNA of the DNS industry. Um, I, th I just think that's, that's stupid. So, uh, what else can you do? Uh, if you can't get the, if you can't prevent it from being created in the first place, um, and you don't want to participate in whack-a-mole as a service, then you have an option of firewalling it. Or you can just say, um, I know these names are going to be used and I can't necessarily keep them from being used, but I could somehow have a reputation system built into my infrastructure, whether it's your name server, your, uh, maybe your web browser, your web proxy, or into your border firewall, whatever that's going to be, um, where you can just say, look, if it's an annoying name, then uh, I will keep it from working on my end, right? So this is what, what you think of as a near-end solution as opposed to the far-end solution of getting it taken down. Um, 
and this works. And I have, I, I'm not going to show you any demos today, but uh, I've participated in creating some DNS firewalling technology that does work. Um, but some things that you've noticed about firewalls is um, you can't just configure one manually. I don't think the people in this room have got enough hours in the week to go in and reprogram your firewall uh, every time somebody annoys you and you want to make sure that can't happen again. Uh, so this becomes yet another profit opportunity for somebody to go do the research that you don't have time for and sell you the reputation system of stuff that you don't want. I created the first reputation system of this kind called the RBL back at a company called MAPS, M-A-P-S, it was spam spelled backward. We thought we were very clever. It was also the mail abuse and prevention system. And I stopped after a few years because I had to sell the company to pay the lawyers because what, my, what the spammers were doing was legal and what I was doing by stopping them was not. So uh, that's me learning things the hard way. Um, but that's, uh, that sort of thing does work uh, where you outsource your research. And the other thing that you've noticed as a firewall maintainer is that if you have to go around to each of your firewalls, assuming that you have more than one web proxy that needs URL filtering or you have more than one firewall that needs IP address or port number filtering, uh, if you have to go to each one of them manually and configure it, um, then the error rate is high, the cost is high, the benefit doesn't really change, and it turns into a, um, a, a stupid idea quickly. So you really are seeing in both the URL filtering and the firewall configuration uh, a publish subscribe industry coming into existence where we now have um, sort of uh, these companies that will come up with not only do the research for you but present it to you in a mechanized format that your equipment can directly subscribe to. So you're essentially inviting your vendors to program your filters for you and to program them all in parallel uh, rather than uh, have to give it to you and go do uh, individual changes on individual firewalls and hope you get them all and hope you get them right. Um, so all of these trends informed my work in DNS firewalling um, and I will have a, more to say about that in a few minutes. Uh, but the point is, this is not our first choice. Our first choice is that the bad domain names are not too cheap to meter and so, so they don't get created in the first place. Uh, our second choice is to take them down at the far end so that we don't have to take individual action at every attack surface edge uh, to stop something that is actually a point source problem. So economically speaking, this is stupid, but it's what we've been driven to. So let's talk about some cool shit. I mentioned that the traditional DNS forensics methodology uh, is to issue a query. And in DNS, when you issue a query, you have to supply the domain name and the type. Uh, and I mentioned that that's kind of a bad idea for criminal forensics because the bad guys are running the name servers that you'll be talking to, so they will see your queries or uh, some takedown as a service company will already have wiped that domain off the map so by the time you're looking for it you can't find anything about it anyway. Either way, that doesn't work. So uh, there is a now vibrant industry of passive DNS database providers. I am one. Um, I am not the only one. The protocol that we use in our system is uh, currently on its way to becoming an IETF standard and there are some free systems out there. Our system, by the way, is free if the person using it isn't getting paid to use it. So if you're an academic researcher or whatever, uh, or a hobbyist or, or whatever, you can just come to us and we'll give, give you access to our stuff. But if you're getting paid, we'd like to get paid too. Um, but here's an example, which is kind of similar to a normal DNS query. I'm providing the name and the type um, the difference is I'm not just getting the current value. In fact, this issued no queries that the bad guy can see. We have a database that has stored everything that we've seen from a lot of name servers for the last four years. So we have terabyte upon terabyte of stored DNS traffic. And it's all indexed, and I'll show you some of the other indexes. And I want to remind you this is not just my product. There are some freebies out there that do this also. Um, but what you can see here is that I listed VIX.com, my vanity domain, for sale last year. By the way, it 
has not sold, so if you're interested, please contact me. Um, but what's interesting about this is you can see the history. And so you could imagine that if I were a criminal DNS user, I might have an uh, interesting history of changing my NS records every time I face takedown somewhere. Um, and so you'd be able to see the entire history of people getting chased from one provider to another uh, using this system. So again, you start with the same thing you would in a DNS system, uh, which is I have a name, I have a type, tell me what you know. The difference is what this thing knows is history, not the current value. Um, here we see an interesting wildcard capability um, where I'm saying, yeah, show me all of the subdomains. Because uh, DNS normally can only tell you an, a single answer that matches the question you've asked. And the only wildcarding normal DNS can do is a wildcard in the zone that will match some random string of characters that you type uh, and it'll synthesize an answer that matches the wildcard record. So normal DNS has wildcarding on the server side. Uh, we have it in the database and so it's possible to now iterate through. Um, I had to grab out just my Comcast business connection IP addresses here to fit it on a slide but you get the idea. Um, this is the kind of thing you would normally need to be, be able to do a zone transfer to see all of somebody's names. Um, it, what we've done here is to reconstruct that zone one response at a time over a period of years. Um, and by the way, I want to do a uh, shout out to Florian Weimar, whose idea this was. Uh, he invented this whole technique, he called it passive DNS logging, and it was the topic of his uh, master's thesis at Uni Stuttgart. Um, so BFK, which was one of his post uh, post-graduation employers does run a system like this that is based on Florian's work. Uh, wrote it in GNU ADA for whatever reason. I guess ADA isn't dead in Germany yet. But um, anyway, uh, he did this. His inspiration, he told me, was that the German registry, the top level domain holder for .de, which is the uh, country code top level domain for Germany, uh, closed off zone transfer. For many years they allowed anybody in the world to do a zone transfer and then they tried to limit it to just German citizens and then they just turned it off. And he thought that the .de domain was uh, public property and so he resolved to make this his thesis project so that he could reconstruct the .de domain and keep it in the public domain. So uh, that's what civil libertarianism looks like in Germany. And good on him because he has really launched a thousand ships with this idea. Um, okay, so here's an interesting case of uh, right hand wildcarding. Um, this is where I wanted to know uh, not what answers uh, end in something but what answers be, uh, begin with something. Um, normal wildcarding does not work like it does when you do the ls command in a Linux uh, shell window. Uh, normal wildcarding in DNS is that the front part of the domain name can, uh, can vary but the back half has to be known. In this case the front part was known and the back half was allowed to vary. I actually discovered two cousins by preparing this slide. So um, this is an example of discovering related resources. Um, I was updating my mail server. Uh, from you know old whatever to new whatever you know, as we do and I had lost track of what I had registered. I no longer knew what domains I owned or what the mail server should be able to respond to and treat as its own stuff rather than going into a mail loop. So I used uh, DNSDB to go get a list. I said show me all of the domains that use my mail server. and. Uh, I should mention in passing, I am a child of the Cold War and in the 1960s I can remember having the job in a public uh, first grade classroom of pulling down the extra set of shades when a certain type of alarm would sound and then we would all hide under our desks and that was, uh, <coughs> that, that was what we did uh, to test for the fact that an uh, incoming A-bomb had just you know, landed off the, the coast of San Francisco. Uh, so the idea of being able to buy property in the Soviet Union appeals to me, uh, which is why I moved VIX.com to VIX.SU. Um, I subsequently learned that no .mil mail, mail server will accept email from a .SU. Uh, <laughs> 
So anyway, I'm in redbarn.org now. So the point is, um, I don't think I'm a criminal, so this is not the way that I clustered a criminal's assets, but a lot of criminals do use the same MX record for a lot of different domains. And if it isn't an MX record, it could be a serve record, a CNAME record, uh, uh, maybe a name server. Um, and if what you want to know is what the police force used to refer to as the reverse telephone directory, where you start with the number and figure out who has it rather than starting with a person and find out what their number is, uh, this is how you do it. You just grab all the responses in transit for a long time and index the hell out of them and you can discover exactly uh, what is related to what. Because criminals are not usually going to be able to create a different mail server name for every mail or every uh, criminal enterprise they, they undertake. Um, and if they do, you'll find them that way instead of this way. So, because uh, that, that behavior turns out to be an anomaly of its own. So, um, finally, let's check some IP addresses. In this case, um, I wanted to know, um, oh, this is the FBI. I thought that they did a really good job of, uh, this is like four-year-old history. They, they've had no churn at all. Uh, all of these records have been there the whole time. Um, and that's a pretty clean system. If you know, those of you who are sysadmins should be able to look at that and say, uh, yeah, the, that, there's very little debugging you have to do if you could keep it that simple and that stable. Um, but then I noted that they had a whole bunch of other things in the same address block because our indexes are not just on names, they're also on IP addresses. And this works just fine on uh, IPv4, IPv6. And it doesn't have to be on a slash 24 boundary. On any bit boundary will work. So if you, if you know that a certain CIDR block uh, is owned by a certain internet service provider who is uh, writing a lot of pink contracts, they are you know, sheltering their customers from uh, complaints and keeping people online no matter what as a, as a contract term, you might want to know what are all of the domain names that point into the address space that belongs to this bastard so that you can go after them one at a time and decide that maybe um, if, if, if you're willing to do, do business with bad people, I'm betting that you're not doing business with very many good ones. So you've just become my, uh, my menu, my inventory list of other people to investigate. Now the FBI is not an example of that, but I, I did want to just demonstrate to them I was talking to one of their sysadmins one day. I said, yeah, you've got a really clean setup, except let me show you the information you've been leaking by putting things at adjacent addresses in the same uh, address block. Uh, so that was kind of cool. Uh, by the way, I gripped out InfraGuard because they have something like 300 different InfraGuard names. Um, so again, I, I, I stopped it to fit it on the slide. Okay, so in the examples I've shown you, they look like DNS output. They look like I've been using the dig command, right? So. Um, in what you'll see here, uh, two examples. One, without the dash J flag on my particular command level tool, um, that is just an affectation. Uh, in other words, the default for this tool is to uh, convert it to human readable DNS-like notation. But the actual database is taking restful commands and giving you JSON answers. And so the real use of this is not to run my cheese bag little command line tool, but to wire this into your own analytics so that you can uh, do this type of clustering and uh, sort of guilt by association or whatever else you want to do uh, from within your own software. Um, and again, the protocol, the particular restful protocol with the JSON results is the topic of an IETF RFC. Um, so, you know, we're, we're, this is in no way proprietary. We invented it, but we want everybody to interoperate. We would hate to see a different standard evolve, but if it does, we'll switch to it. Um, so, uh, do, do not be afraid of the, uh, the possibility of maybe having to run an aux script to parse the output from our system. It, it really is JSON on, uh, uh, underneath. Um, right, so let's talk, let me move away from uh, DNS database use. I mentioned cool shit. I don't intend to focus on a single tool. There are several interesting ones. Um, so people can't be bothered. I, ha I hate those people. Um, what you're seeing here is somebody who is attacking that target, the, the guy on the top is attacking the guy on the left, 
using the guy on the bottom as a reflecting amplifier. And the reason this works is that the guy on the top is able to send a continuous stream of DNS requests or NTP mom list requests or whatever it is. You can send a continuous stream of these requests forged to have come from the victim on the left. And the guy at the bottom, because of the way the internet is wired, does not have any idea that that is a forgery. By the time it reaches him, it looks completely plausible and he will just answer it. And um, obviously the ISP for the guy on the top could prevent this and I wish they would, but they don't because that's a lot of cost on their part, or at least perceived cost, uh, but the only beneficiary will be their competitor over there on the left. And so the idea of spending money locally so that you can help people that you're competing against in business just seems uh, a little bit bizarre to your average board of directors. Uh, nevertheless, the internet requires that we all somehow do this, even though it's not in our direct best interests, we will all boil together like frogs if we don't do it, and that's what's happening. Um, so if you're running a content server, a DNS authority server, uh, then you have to massively over-provision it. You just do. You need a much fatter ethernet pipe, uh, internet connection, server, RAM, you need a lot more uh, computational resources at peak than you will actually use at average. And that's because you will be a DDoS tar target often enough that you had better be able to keep your internet property online while you're being attacked. Okay, so the fact that there's a natural incentive for you guys to build really over-provisioned servers uh, means that you're building perfect reflecting amplifiers for other people to use, not to attack you, but to use you as, an, uh, as a way to attack others. Um, so um, since other people's networks, OPNs, are really the least reliable component of the internet, um, we know we can't somehow call everybody and say, could you please val validate source addresses so that I can be sure that a spoofed source attack is not coming from your network. I mean, who are you going to call and why would they take your call and why would they say yes? So we did a thing which is um, demonstrated here. Um, it's response rate limiting. We added some logic to the name server, which is the reflecting amplifier in that picture, to say, uh, I think that if we're going to send pretty much the same response to pretty much the same network more than, let's say, a dozen times per second, that that could be a DDoS. So let's try suppressing some of that. Let's just drop a bunch of it on the floor. And the exact method that you drop it and when you set the truncation bit to encourage a TCP retry are not the topics of today's discussion. I've got some URLs at the end. Um, but in this picture, what you see is Affilius, who is the top level domain operator for .info. And if you can sort of, I don't know if you can squint hard enough to see it, but there is a, an area below the line and above the line. And this is a usual sleazy graphing trick that we use on a lot of DNS-related uh, re servers. Uh, the part in the negative region is your query volume in, by the bit. And the, type, the part on the, on the top, the positive uh, portion of this, is your response vo volume by bit. So they were being used as a multi-gigabit DDoS amplifier uh, and people would call them and complain and say, would you please stop sending me so much traffic? And they would answer by saying, well, gee, you're sending us all these queries. What do you want us to do? Stop it. You want to be black hole? Well, no, we want to be able to reach real .info names. We just don't want you to answer all the ones that aren't from us. And finally, the affiliates guys installed my patch. Actually, it's Vernon Shriver's patch, but it's my idea. And that's where you see at the right-hand side that all of a sudden they stopped answering all of the, the, the crap. And they posted this to whatever name droppers or DNS EXT, some mailing list. And within a month, every top level domain server uh, had logic like this. And the NSD people, who are the other major authority name server provider in the world other than us, uh, I worked at ISC at that time, so this was a bind patch originally, uh, they added it too. And so if you're running an authority name server and you're not running rate limiting, please investigate it. It's a simple one-line config change. It won't cost you very much in memory. It will not cause people to call you and say that you're unreliable. It's, it is the thing to do. Uh, so there's a much simpler problem-solution coupling uh, than what I've given so far. Um, talking a little bit about DNS firewalls. 
Uh, I mentioned that I created the first reputation system, distributed reputation system, which was the MAPS RBL. We kind of wanted to do the same thing here for name servers that we had done there for uh, mail servers. And um, it is a publish subscribe mechanism and we are actually using a zone file as the encoding of the rule set uh, which is you should recognize as a sleazy trick but it means that all the data paths that that server is already allowed by its firewalls to do uh, will carry this information as well. So it turned out to be an, an ease of insertion thing. So the way you actually program it, again we're not going to get into the details here, um, but uh, there are now about a half a dozen providers and there are hundreds, maybe thousands of subscribers. A lot of reputation information is being published and subscribed in this format. Um, I have a very short example I want to show you. Um, let's see here. Um, right. So uh, I noticed that newly observed domains were crap and I decided to come up with an RPZ that would be a, just a rolling picture of the last 10 minutes of new domains. Uh, and 10 minutes is not the only window. Uh, some people want 30 minutes or 12 hours or whatever, but the 10 minute one is the one I use at my house. Um, so if you visit my house, you will not be able to reach any domain name that was first seen by Farsight, that's my day job, in the last 10 minutes. And what I discovered is that a fair number of domain names don't live to be 11 minutes old. And so just by holding their head underwater for the first 10 minutes, then you can avoid ever dealing with them at all. We did some subsequent research because we have a big uh, spam feed as part of our real time system. And we looked at uh, corpus of spam, big corpus of spam, and found that 60% of it used a domain name that had been created in the last 24 hours. So this is kind of a building block approach where you know, first we created this DNS firewalling capability in one company and then we came over here with this big data feed and created this interesting feed. There are a lot of other RPZs. There's an RPZ full of domain generation algorithms. Uh, there are RPZs full of known, uh, no, just various known bad reputation things. Um, I want to encourage you, I'm going to, I, I got to skip most of this. Um, but I want to encourage you to look at the dnsrpz.info website because it will have a list of the other RPZs I know of. If you're publishing one and you don't know of it, please send me mail, we'll put you on the web. Um, anyway, that's the, the short one hour version of DNS problems and solutions. Thank you for your time. I'll take questions for about two minutes, then they're going to give me the hook.